Have any of you guys been down here before? No. Along no. the way? Cool. We've got the, the guy. So, a <coughs> workshop inside and a fitting facility, um, and that was in the interest of uh, just being able to make nice, quick adjustments when we're down here testing products. So we test a lot of, um, we conduct a lot of our testing down here. So in that way, it's an extension of R&D, but we also do fittings for our tour pros um, and for other VIPs and college programs and other folks like that coming through. So, um, you know, it's a private facility, but we, we stay pretty busy down here. You know, pretty much anything you can do to a golf club, we can probably do in here. But I think the main difference in this build room, since we're, we come in here and we're tweaking all the clubs for the tour pros, we just have to have some equipment that measures at a very tight tolerance. You know, I've got a machine over in the corner there that measures the loft and light of the driver to the tenth of a degree. And so that's one of the differences when you fit an amateur versus a pro. A pro, you're trying to get those specs really tight. It's not that the pros get better equipment. Um, the heads come from the same place, made out of the same material, they're just the same speed off the face, they're literally the same heads. But when we put a club together for the pro, the tolerances on the build are really, really tight. So it's not just around 9.5 degrees, it, maybe a guy needs 9.2. And so we're going to try to get plus or minus a tenth and set that up for him, then go out and hit it, come back and tweak it a little bit more. And, and that's part of the reason we have a build room down here. Most of the builds for Pro Tour are done up at the Pro Tour department, and then we put them in a box and send them out to the pros at their homes. But when they come here to actually get fit for the clubs, we build some stuff for them, you know, to what we know their current specs are, and then, you know, the, each pro will be here for a day or two here coming up pretty soon. And we're trying to get them into the stuff we're going to sell next year. I mean, ideally, we can try to get them to transition to 2016 stuff. That's, that's what we want to happen every now and then. Those guys, like you guys, will fall in love with a certain club and someone's starting to get out of their bag. But you do your best, and we've done a good job of incrementally improving the performance of each club from year to year, so usually it's a pretty easy task to get them into the new stuff. But when they come, it's not always the exact same spec. Sometimes their specs have changed throughout the year for whatever reason. And sometimes, and, and a lot, most of the time, there's new shafts and stuff to try. I mean, the shaft vendors come in here and they give us all the new stuff that's coming out. So ideally, they want us to try to get some of their new shafts in the player's hands as well. Um, and so we'll be trying to experiment with some of that stuff with those guys. And we have to have the ability to kind of run in and out of the building and do make very quick adjustments on the fly. So that's why we have this room down here. And if you're a club builder, I mean, it'd be like heaven for you because you need to have all the pro tour heads with all the actual lofts and <coughs> excuse me, all the CT measurements and <coughs> anything you could possibly imagine that you want to build. Wedges. In fact, you guys just missed Mickelson. He was here 15 minutes ago. It would have been kind of cool if you guys walked in. He was he was grinding one of his wedges. So um, and he does it a lot. He lives here, so he's he's a tinkerer. So he's in here all the time. Um, Thousands and thousands of shafts. You can do whatever you want to do. So for club builders, for club equipment geeks, it's kind of a fun room to, to hang out in. Um, and uh, we'll do some work on R&D clubs as well. And they'll bring some clubs down for tests, and we'll, you know, maybe some of the engineers will come down and go, "Hey, can, we've got this prototype. Hey, can you put it in the shaft setup in this way, this length, and it's for the test we're going to run?" So we'll do some of that as well. But an iPad in here. I need an iPad to pull up all the different data you can look at, but you can look at all the same data that you can see outside: launch angles, spins, speeds, and club head delivery parameters. You can see all that stuff in here. Um, the driver is pretty straightforward because it's kind of a math equation. If you're trying to produce a certain flight, you have to have a certain club set up and you have to deliver a certain angle to the wall and if you don't do that, you're not going to get the flight you want. So it's a, you know, it's not necessarily an easy thing to fix when a guy's not getting the flight of the driver, but it's very easy to analyze and determine and, and understand immediately with a pro or an amateur why he's not getting the flight he wants if he's not. Um, putting's different. We do look at some technical numbers. That's some uh, display. That's actually Paul Montgomery from the other day, uh, a couple days ago. That's his stroke. Um, the system we use in here is that little thing on the tripod down behind me there and it's a, it uses ultrasound which is kind of cool. The, it's a SAM system, you guys may have seen that before. You put the little gadget on there and you calibrate it properly and then it sends back an echo and sound waves and we could look at the angle of the stroke from any angle we wanted and we could see all the, um, we, it also t gives you all the measurements and all the, all the relevant now, angles. It's generally true though that I don't see guys with real funky strokes end up really good at impact with the face angle. So those things indirectly determine how square the face gets an impact, but that face has to be square within, for a tour, probably about half a degree. 
Yeah, if they want to make a 10 footer. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of their biggest opportunity to make up strokes on the field is 8 to 12 feet. You're not going to make enough 3 footers to make to make up strokes of field because everyone's making a 3 footer. It's got a base of 5 degrees closed, and it's got a base of like CT rate or. So, so it does three things for us. One, it helps us determine when we've designed a prototype whether it's going to do in real life what we thought it would do on the computer because all the clubs are designed on computers now. Um, it's stupid. Can't tell you whether it looks good. Can't tell you if it feels good. Can't tell you if it sits right. Can't tell you how the sole peels. Can't tell you how confident it is when they hold on to it. Can't tell you about rack appeal. It just makes a perfect swing every time. So we can isolate to whether when we move the mass properties around, the location, or change the wall thicknesses, or change the CT on the face, it can determine how successful we are in the mathematical equation. In real life, did that translate to better performance on the golf club? Um, the other thing a robot does, the robot does a lot, Greg does a ton of things with the robot, but these are kind of the three major things as I see it. Um, the second thing would be, we can test competitors' clubs. So as soon as a, a tailor-made or a titleist or a new ping driver becomes public domain out there on the rack, we'll go buy a bunch of them and bring them in here and cut them in half. And the robot's the first person that hits them, we'll have people hit them. But the robot, again, tells us what they did well and what they didn't do well. You know, from a very objective standpoint, it's hard to find flaws in the drivers from companies like Ping or TaylorMade Titles because they all make great stuff and that they all make our job very difficult to compete with those guys. So we have to work really hard to stay kind of on the cutting edge and right with those guys who are maybe a little ahead of them sometimes. Um, but if there is a little flaw somewhere in the design of the club, or a compromise I should say, because it's really not a flaw as much as it is you just make trade-offs. Like when you move the CG low toward the leading edge, then if you hit it high in the face, you lose more ball speed than if you didn't have it there. So that's just a physics compromise, it's not necessarily a good or bad thing. And each company is going to have a slightly different philosophy on what they think it makes a better call. You know, maybe TaylorMade wants to really want to reduce the spin, especially reduce the spin, so maybe they start saying locked up because that clubs don't spin as well.